Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and though my most recent program with today's guest was recorded just nine months ago, precisely as I had done three decades before when he first joined me here, I began our program with recollections of first listening to him with rapt attention in the mid-1940s, when as a fledgling teacher and graduate student, I attended meetings of the American Historical Association where a brash, young, Ph.D.-less author M. Schlesinger, Jr. was mischievously thumbing his nose at those older professionals who seemed determined to rake him over the historical coals. I thought because this whippersnapper had just outstripped them all, winning his first Pulitzer Prize for the brilliant and provocative and best-selling Age of Jackson. Nor did he stop there or anywhere. And in the long years since, alternately shifting his sights strictly from the muse Cleo to the political persons whose contributions he would chronicle and or serve, Franklin D. Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, in all this time my guest has played a consistently key role at the vital center of American life, which he himself helped identify and now relates so tellingly in the wonderfully evocative first volume of his long-awaited memoir, A Life in the Twentieth Century, published by Houghton Mifflin. Well, that last discussion with today's guest left all of us, of course, hungering for more, and I must say that no guest had ever, 55 years earlier, quite so presciently giving, given me today's opening cue. For in the New York Times Sunday Book Review of March 10, 1946, Professor Schlesinger told his interviewer, Robert Van Gelder, and I quote, What primarily interests me is the relationship in the sphere of politics between thought and action. The course that ideas take as they travel from the mind of a writer, a philosopher, through the mind of the teacher or perhaps the journalist, and make their way into the mind of the politician or the man of action, and become powers modifying social conditions, laws on the statute books, accepted axioms for conduct and judgment. And so, as I welcome Arthur Schlesinger once again, I want to ask him when, in what he calls a life in the 20th century, in that lifetime of very close relationships with political persons, when he has been most satisfied with the way his own thoughts have been translated into political action. Fair question? Fair question. And of course, there's always a gap between what is theoretically desirable and what is politically possible. And democracy is a matter of persuasion, consent, and compromise. And therefore, uh, no leaders in a democracy can tr translate ideas per, with per, uh, pure and perfect ideas into pure and perfect reality. And, uh, but I would say that, uh, that FDR and JFK uh, both had the capacity to uh, be idealistic in their ends and realistic in their means. And um, in other words, they understood that politics and the, the attainment of ideas is, some, is a matter of bargaining, persuasion, 
and so on. And therefore, you had to often settle for half a loaf or three quarters of a loaf. You mean as the person who provided the ideas or the stimulus? Yeah. Well, I think both Roosevelt and Kennedy were men of ideas anyway. At least they had men of a certain direction. You remember Henry Adams was said, the President of the United States rem resembles the commander of a ship at sea. He must have a helm to grasp, a course to steer, and a port to seek. And I think what distinguishes uh, history-making presidents from non-history-making presidents is whether they have a course to steer. And this is just not liberal president. Ronald Reagan, for example, had a course to, to steer and a port to seek. Many of us thought that port was somewhere back in the 19th century, but nonetheless, uh, he had the capacity to lead to lead people. Among, of course, crisis makes it much easier to be a, an effective president, as Washington facing the crisis of the founding of the Republic, that's setting all the precedents. Lincoln in the Great Civil War, FDR in the first the Depression, and then uh, the Second World War. But uh, two or three of the presidents have had the capacity, without crisis, to impose their own sense of priorities on the populace. Andrew Jackson was one, Theodore Roosevelt was another, Frank uh, and, and Ronald Reagan was a third. Dwight Eisenhower? I don't think he, he was really a, a president who was making the New Deal respectable in the sense that uh, unlike Goldwater and other Republican presidents, he didn't want to tear up the New Deal, but he made it legitimate in a certain sense. But I think, uh, I don't think he was a man of strong ideas. You know, I've been talking with um, James McGregor Burns about these matters. Where do you put, as I ask him, where do you put Bill Clinton? Well, Bill Clinton is an extraordinary and uh, an unlucky combination of attributes. He's a brilliant man. He has an impressive technical command of the issues with which a president must deal. Uh, he has unlimited intellectual curiosity. He has an instinct for remedy. He listens as well as talks. He's a great reader, and so on. Also, he has a certain natural eloquence, particularly with regard to the greatest domestic issue we face, which is the race issue. He's never better than speaking ad lib in a, in a black church. And yet, on the other hand, he's, he has his, uh, weak, self-indulgent personal habits. And uh, he likes to, all presidents li like to be, hope to be loved, particularly if they want to change things, they must accept the fact that uh, people, a lot of people are going to be opposed to what you're doing. I think uh, Bill Clinton, more than, you, more than most presidents, wants to be liked. And as a consequence? As a consequence, he tries to please whatever audience he has. And uh, whereas Roosevelt would say, would say, would say uh, you must love me for the enemies I have made, uh, Bill Clinton doesn't want to make enemies. He makes them. <laughs> I was just going to say he's, he makes them. He certainly made them. But uh, no, I think I think he, he uh, in other circumstances, he might have been a very considerable president. As it is, um, I think he's going to, in spite of the fact he's the one elected president ever to be impeached, in spite of the fact that uh, he, his term ended with these ridiculous pardons and so on, already people are beginning to forget that. The more we live in the new administration, the better Bill Clinton is going to look. Arthur, going back to the, uh, uh, going back to the uh, question of influence and this quotation that you offered when you were a very, very young man, 
This is mm. back in 1946. How would you estimate your own influence upon the course of American life? I think if I had never existed, American life would be much, much the same. Come on, come on. But no, no, I, you know. Where have you been most influential? Where have you been influential? Let's put it that way. Well, I think I may have had some influence within the historical profession. I, but I don't think I've had much influence outside historiography. You mean in, I remember coming to Washington and visiting with you in the White House. I had the sense that there was a Schlesinger influence, don't you? I, th I don't think uh, the Kennedy administration would have been much difference. I mean, there are a couple of small things, perhaps our policy toward Italy, for some reason, was confided to me in the White House, and uh, JFK was favorable to the so-called opening to the left in Italy, that is the admission of the socialist parties to the Italian government. Eisenhower, had vetoed, the Eisenhower administration had vetoed it on the ground that the socialists, the Nenni socialists, were pro-Soviet. By this time, they had been. By this time, they'd long since ceased to be. And Kennedy felt that we should lift the veto, but the State Department was in favor of the Eisenhower veto. So uh, I was given a kind of freedom to maneuver around the State Department, that kind of thing. But. Uh, I think the uh, Kennedy administration would have been much the same. I re I, all I, you know, uh, the influence of uh, subordinates on a president of the United States is much overrated. The pre president influences the subordinates much more than the subordinates influence the president. At least a president like Roosevelt or Kennedy or Clinton, I think they, they're brighter after all, they're presidents and you're not. So they must have some quality. But I remember well enough in reading your books on FDR and uh, Kennedy that uh, brain trusts and the like were important. They're important in, in uh, coming up with ideas and in coming up with words to, ex to make those ideas persuasive. But uh, they, what they do is reinforce the attitudes of, of, of presidents, I think. Now, the present president may not may be an exception to this. That's not a compliment, is it? <laughs> no. But I think, you know, on the whole, a lot of our presidents have been very bright people and uh, perfectly capable of taking care of themselves. And as I say, entourages tend to say things that please the president rather than things that, that, that displease them. They don't argue with presidents all that, as much as they should. So when young Schlesinger said in 1946, what he said what primarily interests me is the relationship in the sphere of politics between thought and action, the course that ideas take as they travel from the mind of a writer or philosopher through the mind of the teacher or perhaps the journalist and make their way into the mind of the politician or the man of action and become powers modifying social conditions, laws on the statute books, accepted axioms for conduct and judgment? That doesn't exist? Oh, no, it does exist very much. But uh, they, it's an unconscious process. It's not so much a process of mentorship. I mean, you, presidents don't need tutors. After all, as I say, they, they're presidents and you're not. So <laughs> they must have, have some skills which you lack. And, um, um, but I think presidents often uh, seek ideas. They like this, uh, presidents like Roosevelt and Kennedy and, and Clinton, for that matter, uh, like discussion. They like to hear the clash of argument. Uh, they, they seek clarification of purposes. They seek uh, how to translate ideas into action, given 
an obstinate Congress or vociferous interest groups of one sort or another in the population. So um, intellectuals around them can be helpful in that regard. But I don't think, I think the, to recur to Henry Adams' simile, they set the course and they have the, have the port to seek. And uh, the, so okay, you remember Keynes in the conclusion of the general theory says that interests are much overrated as influence. Ideas uh, are the dominant influence. And that the businessmen today in rea are expressing the, the rage of some defunct scribbler half a century ago and so on. I think there is that passage. That's my whole, my main interest in, in history was the intellectual history of, of politics and the relation between ideas and action. You wrote somewhere, and I don't remember where it was, something about your father, the historian, indicating that he was perhaps the greater historian. What did you mean? Well, I think he, in the first place, was a much more proficient technical historian. Than what do you his, mean? His son. Uh, he helped bring about, open up new fields for the profession, urban history, history of immigration, uh, family history, and so on. New viewpoints. New viewpoints in America. History of women, particularly. And the uh, longest essay in the book, New Viewpoints in American History, was about the need for women's history. And uh, he was a great champion in his generation of, so of social history, the, the way history of the way people actually lived. So he had much more influence in the in the within the profession than I have I have had. Do he you... also was a great trainer of students. I mean, his PhDs uh, popular, populated uh, American universities. He was much more uh, better teacher than his son. Modesty, modesty, modesty. I was a better lecturer than my father, but uh, I was not uh, in his class as a, as a mentor for graduate students. What do you regret about that, if anything? Uh, I don't regret it. Regret it. I mean, you know, you're stuck with what your skills are. I'm fatalistic about the, about that. The Age of Jackson. What was ultimately the influence of that book? Well, you know, it's had a vacillating influence. It's had, it's had its ups and downs on the historic and historic stock market. At the moment, it is, it is rather up again. Uh, the recent Jacksonian literature, on the whole, takes the side of, of uh, the Age of Jackson. That is uh, the argument, two arguments. First, that there are serious differences between the Jacksonians and the Whigs. And second, that the Jackson uh, derived as much from class conflict as from sectional conflict. And uh, I think both of those propositions are more or less st st accepted today. Our friend Dick Hofstadter, for example, wrote a book about, ja wrote an essay about Jackson which he said the Whigs and Democrats were all expectant capitalists, and there wasn't much difference between them. I think his, his scholars today think that there was a considerable difference between them. And uh, but, uh, as Peter Hale, the great Dutch historian, memorably said, history is an argument without end. And that's why it's such fun. When we spoke last time um, about a life in the 20th century, we talked about that. We talked about the uh, interpretations of the coming of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Have we set, could we possibly set down on an interpretation? Or as you say about the age of Jackson, 
its fortunes rise and fall uh, as the present group of historians interpret and reinterpret the past. Uh, what about the Civil War? Well, I think about the Civil War. You seem to be more definitive about that yeah. in the book. Well, I think, of course, all interpretations are the prepossessions of the present being uh, setting your interest and curiosity about the past. I think the Civil Rights Revolution, when, I, when you and I were young students, uh, there was a, the great view of the James G. Randall and Avery Craven. There was a needless war. It was a repressible conflict. It was uh, not fought about anything of great significance except a bunch of ad uh, demagogic abolitionists who were uh, cr creating unnecessary sectional tensions and so on. Uh, the argument that, I, that I, I was making in the 1940s, along with others like Benny DeVoto, was that the war was fought about a terrible issue, that is the issue of slavery, and that uh, slavery was the cause of the war, as what Lincoln had said. But somehow Charles A. Beard felt that this was really a conflict between uh, the ca northern capitalism and southern plantation ownership, and that slavery was not a major factor. Well, I think that it was a consequence of the Civil Rights Revolution, which has put slavery back where it belongs as one of the central problems of American development. I think now there are very few people who would take the position that slavery was not the basic cause of the Civil War. But what do you do with Beard's uh, interpretation? Not well, setting aside the moral question of slavery. Mm -hmm. Well, he felt that slavery was a, a minor cause of, of the war. It's hard to f figure out why, looking back at it, I mean, it, the consequence of the war was certainly the triumph of capitalism. But whether that was the cause of the war and whether that triumph of capitalism could not have taken place without a civil war, I mean, obviously, just as globalization is irreversible, so continentalization of capitalism was ir irreversible in the 19th century. But weren't, weren't we talking about two areas of conflict? Weren't historians writing about two areas of conflict? And weren't you saying, back when we were young men, this ought damn well to have been a cause of conflict? It's slavery, yeah. I was saying that. Okay, and why must we read out Beard's economic interpretation? Well, I don't think we read it out, and it maybe it will come back in fashion again. But, uh, and Beard was a great historian in a way, and a great stimulus to his histor historical argument. Why do you say in a way? Well, because I think few of his, I mean, the economic interpretation of the Constitution which is a very reductive interpretation of the Constitution, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't represent what most historians feel about the Constitution. Well, it's reductive unless you use the article and economic interpretation. Yeah. Uh, but if you use the article uh, and think of it only as, as an interpretation, uh, is it he as reductive? Well, I think you get the impression from the book that it was an Constitution was an anti-democratic document, a document, a, a document created by great property holders in order to enrich themselves. Okay, and uh, that's a distortion. And uh, I don't think you know the Constitution is now the great beacon of, of American democracy, and and we tri trip over each other, praising the wisdom and. The, restraint of the framers of the Constitution. If you were to separate out the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights, would you say the same thing? No. But I, I, but still the Bill of Rights is, were adopted uh, True. very quickly after the Constitution. And uh, the reason they weren't put in the Constitution was that um, 
Hamilton and Madison, at least in the Federalist Papers, contended that there were all, all these rights were implicit. But it's, it's very useful to have them spelled out. You know, I'm getting the signal. I've gotten the signal. We just have a minute or so left. What do you make of this Adams-Jefferson to-do that's been pushed so hard by uh, the media? Well, I think, again, it's, uh, history is an argument without end. I think um, Jefferson was always a very elegant figure, the second best writer we've had as president next to Lincoln, a somewhat devious figure. Like Roosevelt? Like Roosevelt. Or as Nixon said of Eisenhower, Nick Eisenhower is very devious in the best sense of the <laughs> word. <laughs> and I think Adams was due for um, a, a upward revision. On the other hand, McCullough doesn't really explain or justify why Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Act and why people like Franklin, very cool observer, thought he was a madman. I mean, he, was a, he was an engaging figure. He and Franklin were the only founding fathers who had a sense of humor. I mean, Jefferson there was n never made a joke, as far as the historical record shows. Adams made grim and sardonic jokes. But um, so I think uh, Adams is having a boom, but it will settle down after a while. Have you seen the article in the current Harper's? No. By a fellow who wrote the book, uh, book about the Aurora, the Philadelphia newspaper. Right. R Rosencrantz, I think. Richard, at any rate, he, he, he engages in a polemic against Adams and explains why David McCullough, in his view, overrates him. I'll have to read it. And Arthur, everyone has to read A Life in the 20th Century. And I must say, uh, as I told you before, as I say to Bob Caro, hurry up with the next volume, will you please? I certainly will do my best. <laughs> thanks again for joining me, Arthur Schlesinger. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to the Open Mind P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.